Hello. Making these videos are pretty difficult for me because I never prepare for them and I just pretty much go off the top of my head. Maybe I should do a better job at that, but basically I'm a uh, I'm a an IT guy, not not a movie maker or an actor or a video maker. So, um, you know, please bear with me and I apologize if I jump all over the place or whatever, but I kind of wanted to share um, one of the many things that I I'm learning and working with and doing on my own time is uh, uh, that of container orchestration um, in containers in general orchestration um, you know you've got docker docker swarm and uh, more recently you've got kubernetes which pretty much has become the de facto right now in container orchestration so this is not so much a tutorial or anything like that or a how-to on Kubernetes, so it, it assumes that you already have the basics of Kubernetes down uh, for the most part. Um, this, more, this, this video is pretty much just showing Amazon EKS, you know, so that's the Elastic Container Service. And I find this really interesting because it is basically a full-blown platform uh, by Amazon that, implements, you know, allows you to run Kubernetes uh, clusters on top of this, and it does managing for you, and um, and it does it, you know, the AWS way, you know, highly efficient, optimized, uh, integrates with all of the other AWS components that you've come to know and love from S3 to ELBs, uh, running within your VPC and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so, Making a disclaimer, I am by no means an AWS expert, nor am I by no means a Kubernetes or a Docker expert. Um, I've taken quite a few courses in Kubernetes and Docker and, and played around a lot with the, the technologies, but that does not make me a guru or any, any qualified individual. So, you know, to, to come across as a qualified teacher or instructor. So anything I say can or may be used against me, uh, you know, please look it up, reference it. And, you know, I don't want to say take it with a grain of salt, but um, there's plenty of courses out there that show you that dive into Kubernetes in general. So I'll just leave it at that and, and assume, assume that. So a quick uh, brief uh, history and you know, EKS and such, and why they're so late in the game. And this is coming, you know, uh, hearsay. I've heard it from other people. I've heard it, I've read it in blogs and all that. Amazon had ECS f up until about 2016 or mid-2016. They were, they were really uh, pushing that hard, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, and I mean no disrespect. They were pushing it very hard. At the same time, you know, Docker Swarm, was one of the most popular uh, orchestration-based systems for containers and all that. But Kubernetes, uh, open source uh, project by Google, um, has you know pretty much overtaken Docker Swarm and uh, to the point where you know Kubernetes runs on Azure. It runs on I, th I think OpenStack. I want to say that, um, but. It might not be correct there. Um, you can also set up uh, Kubernetes to run on your own machines on-prem if you want. So there is no dependency to any kind of cloud vendor or uh, platform, if you will. So it's very portable, and you can basically take your whole uh, cluster orchestration-based system and take it off of one cloud vendor, put it on another cloud vendor. I'm oversimplifying it, of course, but... Um, but the idea is uh, it, it attempts to abstract and not be dependent, you know, on a specific, you know, cloud vendor or um, set of, you know, Linux machines or whatever. So I probably didn't say that in a really good way. But anyways, um, Amazon realized that um, Kubernetes had pretty much become the de facto. So they, uh, you know, they worked hard this year and came out with EKS. Um, and what I mean by worked hard is, um, you know, Azure had basically, Azure was kind of ahead in that area because they had AKS for quite a while and uh, gained a lot of popularity and such. So, um, you know, some just recently you've got EKS and, and I think there's going to be some really good things coming out with it and I think it's only going to get better and better. Um, there are, you know, basically why EKS, you know, why would anybody use this? 
um, instead of setting up your own. Well, you know, it, Kelsey Hightower, who's one of the uh, main gurus of Kubernetes, I think he works at Google and all that, um, he has, uh, you know, he has a tutorial and all that, and I've actually gone through all these steps, um, and it's quite a bit, but for the most part, you can, you know, install Kubernetes on your own VMs, you know, a set of Linux boxes or whatever, and there's quite a few components involved. So um, just, you know, real quickly for those that are not too, too familiar with Kubernetes, um, you've got a Kubernetes master. These are all like different nodes, but you've got a Kubernetes master, and then you've got your worker nodes, and then you have a bunch of components that run on your master, and then you have components that have to be agents that have to be installed on your worker nodes. Um, on your master, you know, you've got your controller manager whose purpose in life is to make sure that everything is healthy and that your pods are all running to the desired state and that um, basically everything's running the way you specify inside of your deployments, replica sets, and things of that nature. And then you've got your scheduler that's basically going to communicate, you know, back and forth to each of these nodes to make sure the pods are running. And again, a pod... A pod is like the smallest unit of quote unquote work in Kubernetes, but a pod can contain one or more containers um, that are running. So throughout the life cycle, you've got your pods can be balanced across different nodes. Your pods can come and go. They can die, if you will. And when they die, it's like the job of the controller manager and the scheduler to make sure that it kicks off new pods, you know, in order to meet the desired state, meaning, you know, the minimum number of uh, nodes that you want to quote-unquote replicas that you want to have running so I guess what I'm saying is there's an awful lot um, involved with the the cluster itself if you want to install it manually and again if you you know if you want to really be old school and do it the hard way or give it a shot um, you can go through the exercise um, you know like I said I did and uh, but you got to run it on the Google Cloud platform for this tutorial um, but it gives you a pretty good understanding um, as a part of the exercise and all that in order to get these different uh, components to to be communicating to each other, you also have to create self signed certificates in order to uh, because they all communicate through SSL and things of that nature um, so EKS basically says you don't have to do any of that stuff. just start using our service, and if you create a cluster. Basically, we will provision and create all this stuff for you right here. Um, and then you can go ahead and create, you know, you can create cloud formation templates uh, or whatever to create your different worker nodes. Um, AWS has a, uh, has a few AMIs out there. One such AMI actually comes configured and installed. It's a Linux one that comes configured with, uh, with these components here for the worker nodes so you don't even have to bother with installing that you just basically have to run a uh, you know a, a little cloud formation template or a config map if you will which sets up the role um, so that it can that your different worker nodes can communicate back to your master node um, these nodes itself um, running on AWS will be EC2 instances um, so again you get the benefit of um, you know Amazon EC2 and the whole subnetting and and the whole cluster itself is going to run within a VP single VPC and um, and these nodes can span can span availability zones things of that nature um, one of the things I may I probably forget to mention it but um, based on the types of applications are usually microservices that um, that run lend themselves best to these uh, container based systems orchestration systems but um, one of the things you have to kind of watch out for is if you have um, some of these pods if you have some of your pods running across different availability zones um, when you're running into the issue with stateful sets within kubernetes or if you need to have uh, a shared volume per se um, EBS volumes can't really span availability zones, so what you're going to have to do there is you're going to have to start with, like within Kubernetes itself, you're going to have to create persistent volume claims, which basically, um, um, you know, allow you to link the pods across your different nodes to an EFS, which is 
the considered a best practice an EFS share, which contains your volume. So that way you can have your your pods, you know, running stateful applications across different nodes, um, you know, all sharing the same piece of data, if you will. But I think I'm kind of deviating. I just wanted to mention that EKS actually installs the stuff out of the box and it makes it relatively painless for you, if you will, to um, set up your clusters. One of the other things about EKS is um, there is no free tier available for it, so you will pay a flat rate of 20 cents per hour. So when you're doing these tutorials and such, um, you know, one of the things I did is I went, you know, I made sure that I basically went through a lot of the tutorials, ran them, and then basically deleted my stack. Um, and then Everything I'm going to show you um, is based on, you know, I'm going to try to go and run this uh, example guest book application, but you can actually go to, um, you know, this the site here, and they do have tutorials that show you how to get things up and running with EKS, and I'm just going to kind of go through um, real quickly and not really show you all the steps because I'll leave that up to you, um, but you can go right here and you can go through some of the tutorials. But I'm going to go ahead and, and just show you the like the Kubernetes dashboard thing that you can get from GitHub and installed and what that looks like. And I'm going to go ahead and create the cluster and a couple of worker nodes. So periodically I might be pausing this video because it takes time to create some of these clusters and nodes. So having said that, um, one of the first things that we're going to do is, you know, go ahead and... Uh, Make sure that you have, uh, you know, like a cube control set up. Um, and cube control basically is a command line interface that will allow you to talk to your uh, clusters, if you will, locally. So here I am back home on my own PC. And I'm, once I spin and create these, uh, this EKS cluster, I can communicate and, and send instructions to the master control plane. Um, so again, if you want to learn more about Kubernetes components, you've got your master node and your node components, you can actually go to Kubernetes IO, and there's a whole bunch of good stuff here that explains uh, the purpose of all the different components. So I'm not going to actually go, go through that. Well, I am sorry. The uh, last video, I accidentally stopped it right in the middle of the recording. So I will have to create this as a multi-part video series, so I'll include a link back to the previous video in there and a link to this video from that previous video. Um, anyways, where I was, and I apologize about that, where I was was uh, I was going to go ahead and start that tutorial um, and just kind of show you. I'm going to go ahead and um, they provide you with two cloud formation scripts too. I'm going to go ahead and run the first one, which will set up your VPC and your subnets and your, um, it'll create a security group for your master control plane as well. So preferably in production, you'll want to actually run these cloud formation templates from the command line using the AWS CLI, so you can use uh, the stack create <laughs> the command. But for the purpose of this demo, to avoid any, um, uh, any distractions and things like that, I'll just run it from the UI. Um, just because the end result is we want to see these uh, the stuff being created in the cluster as well. So I'm going to run the setup and I'll go through next and I'm going to call this, I've created this before a few times, but I am going to actually call this EKS demo setup and in production again you'll want to use tags, but for the demo we don't really care and I will go ahead and and go ahead Let's see, do a create, and this will make a little bit more sense on what this is actually going to do. So when this is finished, this is actually creating a VPC that we can run our new EKS cluster in, again, with the, uh, with the subnets inside of there. And those subnets are going to be for the purpose of, uh, you know, like all the availability zones and things of that nature, because our worker nodes are going to be running across that, across those. Um, so I am going to pause this video until this stack finishes, and I'll show you the end result of that. Okay, so that one, that first one finished, and like I said, if you look through all of the events on there, it, it on this particular stack, it creates a VPC and your subnets and your route table um, inside of there. So take a look at our VPC. 
what we've got going on here. And we should have two VPCs. So we got my default one. This is my own personal account. Um, so we got the default one right here, and that's our default one right here. And then here's the one that got created. Uh, basically, as you can see with the route table, things of that nature. Um, let's see here. So that, again, that's a cloud formation template for the most part. As you can see, it's, it's preferable that you run it from the command line in production, but that's okay. We're just, for demo purposes, doing it here. <clears throat> the next step is we're going to actually go ahead and create a cluster through the EKS uh, manager. So let's go. And if you could do a search for EKS or it shows up here, because I've been doing some stuff with it and clearing it out. Um, go down here, don't use the ECS one. Um, let's just go ahead and use clusters. And I am going to create a cluster. And I am going to call it um, EKS demo cluster. And we could use the latest Kubernetes, or we can use 110. I've been using 110 for now, but <clears throat> I'm going to try some things on the later one. Uh, for the role name, we'll use the demo role. Um, so the tutorial shows you that you need to create a role, basically, that allows um, you access. Um, you can actually go in there. It allows you access to the to for your nodes and stuff to and clusters to uh, access EKS services there. For our VPC, let's go ahead and select this one. This got created by that previous cloud formation template. As you can see, it's EKS demo setup, and it basically brings in the uh, subnets for you. So we're going to go ahead and select all three of those. The security group, it created to the previous template. Um, so let's just go ahead and do the uh, this one for the master control plane, and we will. Go ahead and create. Now I'm going to pause the video here because I will say this will take upwards of 10 minutes or so to create. And when it's done creating, you're going to get an API server endpoint and you're going to get a certificate by which you'll need to go ahead and update um, one of your config files so that you can communicate to your cluster. Um, before I pause the video, there's two ways that you can communicate to your cluster. Um, you can use AWS uh, CLI, or you can use this um, third-party tool called EKS CTL by Weaveworks, I believe. Um, so that'll allow you to create clusters and stuff like that from the command line. Um, but when this is finished, um, what we'll have to do is we'll have to instruct uh, our cube CTL proxy, basically, or kubectl will have to give it a, a path and an endpoint and a certificate and such that we can communicate directly to this given cluster. Um, so I am going to go ahead and pause this video and wait for this to complete. Okay, it's been about 10 or 12 minutes or so, and the cluster finally got created. Like I said, this will take some time. And again, um, as a reminder, when you're going through this demo or trying things out with EKS, please do be aware that you will be paying 20 cents an hour. Um, it doesn't seem like much, but it, it can add up if you uh, leave it running or you create your cluster and you forget that it's running and you leave it running overnight and things of that nature. So do be prepared. There is no free tier for this. Um, so what we've got, now that the cluster has been created, is we've got an endpoint for our cluster, as well as um, a certificate for the cluster. And what we're going to need to do at that point is we're going to have to go ahead and, and um, for kubectl, we're going to have to go ahead and, and update our Cube config EKS file. And what we're going to have to do, let me just make this a little bit bigger here, um, wider so I can. All right. So as you can see, I've been trying this a couple times, uh, deploying different applications and stuff like that on here. Um, close down this window right here. What we want to do is we want to update every time you create a new cluster. Um, Technically, in production, you just only do this once or whatever, but every time we update a new cluster, create one, we want to update our server and our certificate authority data um, so that when we use kubectl, which is a command line to communicate to Kubernetes, um, it'll know exactly where it's going. So let's go ahead and do that right now. 
So I'm going to take this server endpoint and copy it to the clipboard. And let's go down here. And paste that in. Let me just make sure that it got the right one here. Um, now, sometimes I've been having some problems with uh, the Git Bash here to try to copy it. So let me try this again. I am going to copy. As you can see, I don't know if that's an issue with the, uh, the Bash shell because I'm running this on Windows. Let's go ahead and try it again. Interesting, it still looks like it didn't do it. So one second here. What I'm gonna do is uh, open up a line here. Gotta pay attention. I actually got burned in one of my tests. I thought I was uh, pasting the right value and it turns out it kept pasting the old one over and over and over again. So let's just make sure. Okay, this time it did it. it I've noticed periodically it does it if you open up a new line, but I think this is an issue with uh, Git Bash on Windows and nothing else basically other than that. So now for the certificate of authority, let's do the same thing. We'll go ahead and click this to copy it to the clipboard right there and basically um, let's make sure that it does the same thing there. Paste this in, make sure that this looks okay. So I don't trust it, S0T0LQ0, and then the top one. Okay, I'm gonna, I think that looks pretty good. So anyways, um, we have to update this file so that when we use kubectl, we can go ahead and, and communicate to our clusters. So um, let's go ahead and just close that down. Next thing we want to do is create our worker nodes. So for that, we go back to cloud formation and create a stack. And I am going to select another template, which is our EKS worker nodes setup. And um, basically, that's just another cloud formation template that's going to go ahead and and create um, security groups. It's going to create our uh, worker nodes. I'm only going to specify two, um, amongst other things. And so we'll end up with um, EC2 instance and uh, other things here. For Just my luck, I accidentally stopped the recording again and actually ended the, the recording session itself. So once again, I have to create a, another video, which is a continuation. So I guess this will be a multi, <laughs> it continues to be a multi-part video thing. Now I know on YouTube why sometimes when you look at videos and such, you'll see part one, two, three, four. Um, I guess it's a fairly common thing. So continuing, I apologize for that, but hopefully this doesn't cause much of a distraction. Continuing from where, where I left off, um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and upload our second stack to create the uh, worker nodes for the most part. So let us go ahead and, hmm, okay. I better refresh my page here. Well, I guess when it rains, it pours. Okay, so I had to re-log in. Uh, apparently, my session had expired there. So, using our worker node setup cloud formation script, we'll go ahead and select that. So, we will call this EKS Demo Workers, and we're going to point this to the EKS Demo Cluster. Our security group is going to be the uh, control plane one. We'll call this... Uh, demo node group. We want a maximum of two nodes here. So basically those we only want two worker nodes and we want a type of small. And here's that image ID um, from Amazon that'll actually, at least in nor Northeast region, that comes configured with the uh, cube proxy um, in the other agent on there too for uh, um, you know so for Kubernetes so that you don't have to install them on the individual nodes themselves, um, and it's a Linux uh, it's a Linux instance as well. So we use our 
grab our EC2 key pair that we had to create. Our VPC is going to be this EKS demo setup. Um, and we'll go ahead and include the three subnets that got provisioned with the first cloud formation script. We'll do next. Um, again, in production, you want to give it a tag, but for demo purposes, we don't really care. And here's our information. So let's go ahead and acknowledge that and create. This will take a little bit of time. Um, let's see here. Is it creating the stack? Oh, that was interesting. Normally, when you go back to the screen here, it would actually show it, so I had to refresh it. Um, I'm getting all kinds of interesting little things happening right now. So I'm going to go ahead and monitor this, and I will pause the video and resume it when this is finished. Thank you. Okay, that finally finished here. So we've got our demo workers and our demo setup, as you can see on this one right here. It um, created a whole bunch of things for us. It created a role, our security groups that are needed, and what we're basically doing here, the end result, and it's going to create our, our EC2 instance as well. The end result is it's creating these down here. So, so we manually created this master when we created the cluster, and now we're creating these two worker nodes here um, with this handy dandy script that you can get from the tutorial when you when you take it. So there's really nothing magical about this. It just basically, um, you know, a whole lot of cloud formation um, setup for the most part. So let's take a look at what we got here. We go to our EC2 instances. We now have two running instances because we've created our two worker nodes, as you can see. Um, each instance is going to have a dedicated volume associated with them. And let's see what we got here. So we've got two running instances. There we go. So we this is from our previous um, my previous examples and stuff that I was doing when I was tearing down the stacks. Okay, so now we actually have our cluster up and running, and we have two worker nodes theoretically that are supposed to be communicating to the cluster. So again, as I mentioned, this is not a a tutorial on on Kubernetes. So, but. I'm not going to get any nodes showing up here, but technically what you should have if you've configured this correctly is you're going to have two, the two nodes show up with this command here, but instead it's going to say no resources found. Um, and for the most part, for the reason for that is um, when you follow the tutorial and all that, there is a, a I am authenticator that you have to download as well, um, which basically allows you to get access from your worker nodes back to your master node. And we installed, I went ahead and installed the authenticator and you will too if you take the tutorial. What we need to do is we need to actually apply another template that they provide to us, which basically is going to, is called the AWS auth. And we have a role ARN. So what we got to do is go back to our cloud formation stack here. And I did that on purpose, just so you could see. Click on this one, go to the outputs. As you can see, we've got each instance is gonna run under this particular role. So that's very important. So we have to take that value, go back in here, and put it in there, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and apply that given role. So I'm going to say kubectl apply dash f aws auth yaml. Okay, so we went ahead and created that. And now you can see our two nodes are showing up. They're still booting up, so they're basically in the not ready state. But where, we are, where we're at right now is we're trying to get it to the point where 
these two nodes, these two nodes here are properly communicating back and forth um, to the master node in the control plane. So let's go ahead and rerun this command again. <clears throat> and as you can see, now they are ready. So the good news is up until this point, our cluster has actually been created and we have uh, two worker nodes on the cluster and we're all set to go. We can actually start deploying applications. But first, before I do that, another little thing I wanted to show you is uh, Kubernetes comes with a uh, dashboard and um, that you can uh, visually view all of your deployments and your services and things of that nature. And I can include a link to the, uh, the GitHub thing too, but um, basically I'm gonna go ahead and install this dashboard by going through all these given steps here. Um, and you can too if you, if you choose to, but for the purposes of this, I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, let's see here, pause the video for a second. I'm going to pause the video and then actually install this um, because you don't want to watch me install this. It's just basically running a few CloudFormation scripts and waiting and things like that. Um, I'll leave that up to you as an exercise on your own, but it's 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 pretty straightforward too. So I'll be right back. Okay, so I installed all the necessarily necessary uh, temp templates, if you will, um, to start up or to configure the dashboard within the uh, control plane and all that. So I need to kick off uh, the proxy server so that we can communicate to the dashboard. And let's go ahead and try opening up the browser and see if we can actually log in. Okay, that's a good sign. So that's from our local host. I am going to, there's two ways to log in through kubeconfig or through token. So we'll log in through token. So in order to get the token itself, what we're going to have to do at this point is run another cube control command. Let's see what we got here. So it, it'll bring in this given token. We will paste that inside of here. We don't really want to save that. Okay, so now I've actually logged in. So what we've got here is a, basically it's a, um, a graphical user interface, um, a pretty nice one. Um, and basically you can see all this information from the command line if you're a command line kind of a person. I'm, I'm kind of a command line person, but I really like um, the uh, dashboard. And this is actually Kubernetes. So we've actually got it configured now to actually talk to our cluster on AWS. And what this basically does is, um, you know, you can traverse all of your Kubernetes namespaces as you create different applications and such. You're probably going to want to create a namespace for each of those. Um, so namespaces are basically all they, as they are, um, like in any other programming language. Um, you can examine your cluster. Let's see here. You can see your different your namespaces. You can see your nodes. So these are those two EC2 instances, but you don't see them as EC2 instances in this interface because again this is Kubernetes and so it's basically an, uh, an abstraction layer on top of the underlying pinnings whether it's running on Azure or AWS so these are your given nodes your roles that you have um, our pods we don't have an application deployed yet replica set replication controllers all of these kinds of things um, in your configuration map. So we've got our dashboard set up. So we are real close. So now what I'm gonna go ahead and um, do, and by the way, again, if you wanna SSH into your EC2 instances, make sure that you open up port 22 for your security group. Um, but let's go ahead and try to deploy and run this sample. This is another part of the tutorial, the uh, guest book application. 
So, and again, the reason I didn't show you all the steps for the dashboard is this is kind of an EKS tutorial, not tutorial, just a demo. Um, and I didn't want to bore you with all the steps on the dashboard since you can actually follow um, the GitHub and all the instructions there to go through that. Okay, this guestbook application is not going to be the most exciting one, but it's a good a demonstration of what you're going to see um, if you follow the tutorial. So, um, basically, it's 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 a uh, it's going to have two microservices. It's going to have your Redis one and your front end, um, and you'll see the end result of the application. But this is our back end, and um, we're going to have a Redis master and a slave, um, and two slaves, if you will. Um, and these are going to be pods. And then here is our front end too. So you'll see how they um, get distributed. So let's first of all install the um, the master, Redis master. And what we can do is we can say kubectl apply dash f Redis master deployment. Okay, and again, since we um, set up our uh, our AWS IAM authenticator and stuff, um, we're able to, and our cube uh, config file, we're able to communicate directly to our AWS cluster locally on my PC back here. So now we got the master set up, let's go ahead and do the slaves. And again, this um, is from that GitHub site. So I'm not really gonna go into details in the YAML, it's just basically, it's it's just basically Kubernetes um, syntax. So it's they're basically gonna be deployments across the board and with replicas so you can actually specify it's similar to it's basically similar to auto scaling except for the replicas is going to be like a min value so there's always going to kubernetes is always going to make sure that there's three of the front ends running across the various nodes and system be, because of that value here um and they're fronted by services which basically let the out, outside world communicate to the pods directly through IP address, and what's kind of interesting here is um, the services themselves for the front end is going to be a type load balancer. So um, AWS is going to actually turn around and create a um, load balancer with that when we actually apply it. So let me get back to this other window right here. So what I've done is I've created the master and the slave. So if we say kubectl get pods, you can see that we have one master and we have uh, two slaves running right now. So now we want the front end and that's going to be our next step right here. So bear with me. I just want to go ahead and Make sure I got the right name of the file. So we'll say kubectl. Uh, let's say apply dash f front end. Okay, so as you can see, it's created that. Um, let's go ahead and make sure that we have things up and running. So we'll say kubectl get pods again. There's our three front ends based on the replica that we said we wanted three. Uh, as far as the slaves, we got two of those going simply because we have two specified there for the replica. And by the way, these this this tutorial it's pulling down these open source uh, it's pulling down these containers from the registry. So I did not write these. Um, um, so these are the images right here based on the spec that you get from the uh, deployment files. So Let's go back to our command line again. So our pods look okay. Let's take a look at uh, our services. And there you go. We've got our front end. We've got our front end service, and we got our master and slave. Which um, these are these are basically not exposed to the outside world because there's no external IP. The front end is communicating to Redis as a cache. So the idea is we're, we're going to have, th we got three front end pods right now and they can all communicate back to Redis through, um, through the cache itself. So that's how they're going to share data with each other. And this is a type load balancer. Um, and what we can do here is, 
take a look at uh, Git nodes. Make sure we've got our two nodes running. Just kind of take a look here. I'm just kind of poking around. Describe node. Oops, didn't, uh, I didn't like that. Like I said, I'm having some problems with, um, with my cut and paste within uh, Git Bash here. So I'm just doing a describe node here on one of them. I just kind of, kind of poking around, taking a look, um, going fishing a little bit. As you can see on the node, you can see some of the agents running on there. We've got our cube proxy. We've got uh, inside of it, we got our dashboard um, within namespaces here. So just kind of playing around. If we take a look at our, um, take a look at our dashboard, Let's go back to overview. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at our namespaces there. Um, take a look at our deployments. We should have some now. So based on those commands that I ran, all of a sudden these are showing up on our dashboard. Um, so again, you'll be able to see the power here. So we've actually, uh, we've got, for the most part, we've got our front-end application. we got our, our two Redis applications if you will um, we've got our replica sets um, so whenever we say um, we want kubernetes to maintain a desired state at all times of three pods you know it's in the form of replica sets with the deployment um, it's just basically saying hey you have three pods up and running uh, and kubernetes will manage behind the scenes um, through eks which nodes they get run on but again keep in mind um, this is all basically running on those two nodes that we've created. Um, so let's see, we've got our services going on here. So how do you actually access this? So what we wanna do, um, the application itself, we're gonna go to EC2 again. And remember how I had said before where the front end is actually um, we deployed actually a service to the front end, which is of type load balancer. Um, what we've got right now is what we have created is a load balancer did get created as a result of that last deployment. So if I bring up the details on that and click here, not click, but just copy the DNS name, put it in another window here. Voila, so basically what we are running now, we are actually um, running the front end, which um, we don't know which one of the three pods it's on, but we are running a front front end, which is a guest book. So I could say, hello, this is message one. And we can submit it and then I could say, hello, this is message two. And I can submit that. Um, and then I can actually go into this window so you see that there is actually some magic here. Um, so I'm in my Chrome right there. As you can see, it's kind of like a chat application. Um, hello, this is from the Chrome browser. We'll go ahead and submit that. As you can see, it's not going to refresh it right here. But if I just refresh the application, you can see. So it's pulling it off from the cache. So this basically is proving that um, we our pods are being hit by the load balancer, which is directing traffic to them behind the scenes. And you know everything's good to go there. The other really cool thing I wanted to mention here too is in the dashboard. Now you can do this from the command line. Too, but I'll just show you in the dashboard. So we've got three pods running for the most part um, for the front end pods. So if I, again, if I say cube, CTL, get pods. Okay, so that's um, three from the, that's, we got three of our front end pods running. I can say, I want to scale. I could say, actually, give me five. I don't want three anymore, I want five. So now I am scaling that. As you can see, it looks like it's um, 
going to try to create uh, two more pods as so they're kind of in the uh, pending mode. So let's see what happens here. Well, that's interesting. I must have done something uh, by accident here. Not really sure what happened there, but I went ahead and scaled it back up to four. So um, let's see what we got going on here. That's the first time that that's happened. Okay, it's probably uh, my session probably expired there because I did have to re re log in. Um, so now I've scaled it up to four, basically, as you can see. Um, we've got four pods running. Right there, and now I can actually scale it back uh, down, perhaps. Let's see what we got here. We can say view as YAML. As you can see, um, you can view each of these right up here. You can view the actual YAML definition for them. Actually, let me show you. There you go. When we said scale, it basically it set the replicas. And again, you can do this from the command line. You could say uh, with the kubectl replicas equals for that on, on the given uh, deployment part. Um, but this is not a Kubernetes uh, tutorial. This is just a little demo on EKS. So let's set it back down to three. Okay, so it's gonna take a little bit, but it's gonna actually downgrade to three. Um, again, you can delete, you can view and edit your YAML. Um, there's all kinds of uh, interesting things that you can do. Um, again, one of the main things, um, this is just kind of an overview of, of running Kubernetes on EKS, EKS, I should say. But again, one of the main things to, to keep in mind is um, if you're going to have a stateful app um, with Kubernetes, what, what you can do and AWS makes this uh, quite easy for you. Um, you would create a persist, persistent volume claim within Kubernetes that'll go ahead and link to um, your physical volumes over on AWS, but you would do it as a EFS uh, share. So you wanna create, um, so EFS allows you to span availability zones and that would allow these individual pods because you, you know, you can do, uh, you don't really have much of a control unless you start um, doing more specific things um, in your definitions to control things to certain nodes. But the whole idea behind Kubernetes for the most part is um, you'd like to have Kubernetes the master basically figure out which nodes to schedule your pods on. So the idea is any given time, you're not really gonna be 100% sure which nodes your pods are running on if you allow Kubernetes to do it for you. But in the case of a stateful application, you'll need to have a uh, um, use EFS in that case because again, EBS volumes can't span multiple availability zones. So if you encounter that need, um, go ahead and look into uh, persistent volume claims. So that's pretty much it. I apologize. This ended up being a lot uh, more lengthier than I thought. Um, this was kind of like a, um, kind of like a lengthy lengthy demo of just some of the things that I've uh, you know been looking at with EKS. Um, and as a matter of fact, I mean I've gone and I've actually deployed um, more applications than just the guest book here. But I just kind of wanted to show you what you get with EKS, and hopefully um, you know this will demystify a little bit of um, EKS for you to the point where you can actually start going to the FAQs or the getting started and, and go through the tutorials and, um, you know, install the uh, guest book application yourself and the dashboard and just kind of take a look at, look at it and how, um, you know, the pods run on the individual nodes, which basically behind the scenes um, get translated to these EC2 instances. So I guess I could ramble on more and more, but I'll probably stop there. And one of the things that you're going to want to do, um, because this, again, this is not free, EKS, um, when you're done with everything, you're going to probably want to uh, 
you know, undo your deployments, um, or you can just basically do what I do is just tear down, tear down your workers and the cluster. You want to make sure you delete the cluster and then, you know, so you tear down the workers by deleting this stack and then your demo setup, you probably want to delete that stack. But in between, you're going to probably want to go ahead and into your EKS cluster and you'll want to delete that because you will be charged again um, 20 cents per hour and you don't want to leave this running overnight or for a while if you're just doing this as a demo and learning things. So hopefully that helps. Um, I apologize if it wasn't too detailed at spots or too drawn out at other spots, but again, this wasn't to show you um, in excruciating detail everything you needed to do. This would just kind of give you a good rough picture of what EKS, EKS is and what you can do with it. So thanks for watching, and I'm sorry about the uh, multi-videos here because I kept stopping that recording. So alrighty, well, you all have a nice one, and thanks again. Bye-bye.